not one, but two new members. So, Christina. Greetings, everyone. Please join me in the five-way test of the things we think, say, or do. Is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it build goodwill and better friendships? Will it be beneficial to all concerned? And is it fun? All right. Please bow your heads for our prayer. O oh, Lord of the universe, we are thankful for this day you have given us, and we pray for your blessing over this time together. Help us to remember those who are suffering or could use a helping hand. Remind us of the importance of service above self and how, with your guiding hand, we may make a difference in the lives of others. We pray for your presence in this gathering today and to be with Rotarians everywhere. O oh Lord of all, we pray, amen. And now for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. You may be seated. Sorry about that. Wrong J. Much, a much shorter J. Uh, I'm Jay Barth. And uh, as always, I want to welcome everybody to uh, the Clinton Presidential Center. Um, we do have one uh, visiting Rotarian uh, today, um, Gabby Holland. Uh, from Bentonville Noon. Gabby, are you here? Welcome. We're very happy to have you today. And we have lots of guests. And so I'm going to just ask all of our guests, uh, and your, their, their uh, hosts don't always have the best handwriting in the world, uh, so we'll ask all of the guests, all the hosts, to stand up so we can celebrate y'all's uh, being here today as well. Awesome. Good afternoon, Rotarians. We, um, as President Natalie said, we have two new members to introduce today. First, I am pleased to welcome Justin Avery to Club 99. He has both a BA and a master's in accounting from Hendricks College. Justin is the chief executive officer of Rock Region Metro. He joined the organization in 2012 and spent his first 10 years in the finance department managing the agency's finance and administration needs as the chief financial officer. Justin is a graduate of Leadership Greater Little Rock class of 33. He serves on board of directors of Metro Plan, the Downtown Little Rock Partnership, the North Little Rock Chamber of Commerce, and the Arkansas Transit Workers Compensation Trust. Justin is a member of the American Public Transportation Association, American Institute of Certified Public Accountants, Government Finance Officers Association, Arkansas Government Finance Officers Association, and Arkansas Society of Certified Public Accountants. He and his wife, Caitlin, have one newborn child. For fun, Justin enjoys golfing, biking, woodworking, gardening, and trying all the food and drinks available in the capital city. Well, please help me welcome Justin Avery. Our next new member is Regina Taylor. Please, I am very pleased to welcome her. She has a BA in political science from the University of Arkansas Pine Bluff and a master's of public service from the Clinton School of Public Service. Regina is a lifelong Girl Scout and currently serves as the Chief Operations Officer for Girl Scouts Diamonds of Arkansas, Oklahoma, and Texas. In this role, she works to ensure that girls from the Council's 79 county service areas have access to participate in Girl Scout programming, troops, and camps. Regina is an experienced project and program manager who enjoys working with Facebook faith 
based organizations and nonprofits to provide guidance on program development, efficiency, and effectiveness. She is a member of the Clinton School Alumni Advisory Board and the Big Brothers Big Sisters of Central Arkansas Board of Directors. Regina is a proud member of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority. She and her husband, Kevin, have one son, Clay. For fun, she enjoys reading, thrift shopping, and supporting the visual and performing arts. Please join me in welcoming Regina to Club 99. Thank you, Justin, Regina. Welcome to Club 99. So glad to have you with us. All right, so a few quick announcements today before we get started. Um, thank you to the volunteers who put together the fabulous teacher's luncheon at Dunbar Magnet. Dunbar, Dunbar Magnet Middle School is our adopted school there, and they put on a great time for them, so thank you to you guys. Um, Thursday from 3 to 4 is the awards banquet at Dunbar, and we, our club, participates in that, recognizing students for outstanding citizenship. So I'll be there, Karen will be there. If anybody else would love to like to attend, please, please let us know. We love to recognize these hardworking students at the end of the year here. And then be sure to look at your newsletter, lots of social events coming up that I've mentioned over the, um, uh, over the weeks here. So check it out. There's lots of details in there and some great fellowship opportunities coming up. All right, so for our guest, um, each year a president of Club 99 picks a theme, and this year our um, theme is the power of fun. So each week I give a fun tip and we kind of talk about the power of fun in our lives. So fair warning today, because today's fun tip may skew a bit to the working moms in our club, but um, you'll see up here, we're in the throes of may -cimber. I don't know, I know the moms out here know what may -cimber is. It basically means it's the busyness of December, yet with no president uh, presents or um, San Santa Claus or any of that fun. It's just busyness at the end of the year. It's endless graduations, field days, field trips, teacher gift buying and crafting, uh, end of year science projects that are due, summer camp forms, dress like your favorite character day and then you don't have an outfit and you're running around like a mad woman in the mornings. All of this makes May Simber. So here are some funny memes that I was like, okay, this is definitely speaks to what we're dealing with. So it's fun for for the kids except for those exams um, but exhausting for the parents and particularly moms who are typically ending up doing a lot of this buying and calendar organi organizing and form filling and all that so what in the world does may simber have to do with the power of fun I mean, clearly not much for parents, but it is a great example of what Catherine Price in her book, The Power of Fun, that we've been talking about. Um, it, she mentions the word time confetti. And time confetti is a term that journalist Bridget Schulte coined in her book, Overwhelmed Work, Love, and Play When No One Has the Time, that refers to all the seconds and minutes in our life lost to unproductive and unsatisfying multitasking. And wow, there's a lot of time confetti going on in May, um, particularly for moms. So Schulte described it as contaminated time in an interview that she did with Terry Gross on Fresh Air, um, NPR's Fresh Air. Not only are we juggling work demands and home demands, all of us, we've now ratcheted up the standards of kind of what parenting is and what that looks like, and all this has polluted our time. So it may look like you are in a moment of leisure from the outside, but on the inside you're crashing around thinking about, you know, what's for dinner? Uh, did I ever send that form for the field trip? I've got to get this email off to this client. And you're never fully present in the moment. And we've talked about this. Psychologists agree that it's the peak human experience when we get to lose ourselves in a moment, um, a moment like true fun, like we've been talking about. So all of this time confetti and polluted time, which a big part is spent on our phones and on screens, accounts for the, dis the discrepancy between the amount of leisure time that experts say that we have. In fact, um, uh, they claim that we have more time um, for leisure than we did in the 1950s. I question that, but experts say that. And, and then, um, so, so that is, is, is countered to the amount that we feel is available. So time management, 
management expert Ashley Willens in her book Time Smart said, people end up enjoying their free time less, and when asked to reflect on it, estimate that they had less free time than they actually did. That's how invasive the, time, the technology time warp is. Time confetti makes us feel even more time impoverished, impoverished than we actually are. So whereas true fun moments with flow, they rejuvenate us, Tom Confetti makes us exhausted. Um, trying to hold too many things in our heads at one time taxes our working memories and leaves us drained. And um, as psychology today defines it, working memory is a form of memory that allows a person to hold a limited amount of information at the ready for immediate mental use. It's what enables you to do a math problem in your head or um, quickly remember names of people that you just met at a party. When we do, but when we have time confetti going on and we do this an entire work day, we end up so fried that even though we know that we'd feel much better if we met up with a friend or went to the gym or just sat down and played the piano, we tend to do other things. We probably just spend that majority of time staring at a screen or, and, and you know, we don't have the energy to, um, you know, do anything besides just kind of crash on the couch, grab the remote, grab the phone. So all of this is a result of, the, of, of this time confetti, and we end up spending a lot of our leisure time that we do have on screens and saying that we're having fun, right? But in reality, that's not true fun. It's not doing any good for our bodies, for our mental, for our emotional. So this week, your homework is to think about the time confetti in your life. Think about that polluted time in your life and see what you can do to decrease that and fill it more, with more meaningful and joyful, true fun moments. And then for your mom, moms, the homework is just get through May, Simber the best you can <laughs> and um, don't send your kid with the pin worthy snack, pin, Pinterest worthy snack, they don't need it. So, <laughs> all right, let's watch our uh, member video today. My name is Ed Levy and I work at Cromwell Architects Engineers. I've been there since 1985 full time but I've been there on and off since 1963. And so I've been an architect my whole life, basically. There's pictures of me down at the Cromwell firm when I was two years old in an outfit my grandmother made me, walking around doing architecture as a two-year-old. Starting in 1998, I started riding my bike pretty regular. And I would just ride when I could. And then I thought, man, this just isn't enough. So I thought, you know, I'll ride at lunch and I'll build it into my day. So I ride every day at lunchtime. People started getting upset because they wanted to go to lunch with me. Come to lunch, meet us for lunch. I'm like, I can't, I gotta get my ride in. And also it wasn't enough miles, really. 10 miles just turned out to not be really enough. So then I thought, well, you know, I can ride to work now because of the river trail. And I did that for years and then the office moved and I had extra miles to ride every day. It was already a long ride, and now is even longer. So I decided I gotta get a faster bike. And I'm at the bike shops looking around, and they've been trying to get me on this e-bike for years. And now the e-bike's looking good because I'm upgrading to a faster bike and faster bikes are very expensive. And the e-bike is somewhat affordable compared to the faster bikes. So now they've got my attention and they managed to get me on one of them. I'm like, okay, 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 I'll try it. And my advice to you is to not ever ride an e-bike until you have enough money in the bank to buy it either right then or the next day because you will not be able to sleep thinking about that e-bike, worried somebody's gonna come in and buy it out from under you once you've ridden on it. They are that much fun. It's the winter of 2018 and I've just got my new e-bike. And there's all these twos that I developed over the years. The twos were the reasons not to ride. Like it's too windy, it's too hot, it's too cold, it's too far, it's too hilly, or I'm too old, or I'm too slow, or I'm too sleepy. There's all these twos. And it turned out 
the e-bike just took all those twos and just pushed them off the table. So, you know, these videos are about what, what do I do for fun? And I do a lot of stuff for fun, like just being out here on the river is a lot of fun. Every day's a vacation out here on the river. So I come home to this every day. But one of the other things I do for fun is I ride my bike because it's so much fun. And it takes the worst time of my day, rush hour traffic, and it turns it into the best time of my day, the high point of my day, every day that I ride. I love that, Ed. That, that's a true fun moment when you take the worst part of your day and turn it into the best part of the day. I, I truly love that. All right, so we are going to get started with our great program today. I'm going to ask uh, President-elect nominee Mitch Bettis to come up and introduce our program. And Mitch is, oh, no, nope, sorry, somebody else is, no, Debbie's introducing it. Yes, I, wow, I have just <laughs> messed up everything. Jay Barth is Jay Gadbury. All of, okay, Debbie's going to come up and introduce uh, it's May Simber. I'm blaming you on that. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. Debbie Davis is going to come up and introduce, and then Mitch is going to be uh, uh, moderating for us. So, Debbie. Thank you. Oops, there go my glasses. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us today to learn more about the Proton Center of Arkansas. It's my pleasure to introduce you to our guest speaker, panelists, and moderator today. Our speaker is Dr. Sanjay Maraboyina. He's a board certified radiation oncologist and medical director of the UAMS Radiation Oncology Center where he specializes in the use of proton and photon radiation therapy to treat lung and genital urinary cancers. He holds an appointment as the associate professor in the Department of Radiation Oncology at the UAMS College of Medicine. Dr. Mirabolina earned his medical degree from the University of Cincinnati College of Medicine and completed his residency in radiation oncology at the University of Cancer Care Center an oncology program of excellence designed by the National Cancer, Cancer Institute. He completed an internship at Christ Hospital in Cincinnati, Ohio. He is also an active researcher currently studying the effects of brachytherapy on prostate cancer and the effects of insulin glucocorticoids on the cell cycle. His work has been published in the International Journal of Radiation Oncology and presented at the American Society of Hematology annual meeting. Our panelists today, we will have Dr. Cam Patterson. He serves as the chancellor at the University of Arkansas for Medical Sciences, mm -hmm. leading, the Arcan leading Arkansas's only health sciences university and academic medical center. A renowned cardiologist and healthcare mm -hmm. administrator, he became chancellor on June 1st, 2018. Before that, he served as Senior Vice President and Chief Operating Officer of New York Presbyterian's Weill Cornell Medical Center in Kamansky Children's Hospital in New York. Dr. Patterson previously held numerous academic, academic and clinical appointments at the University of North Carolina, including Physician-in-Chief at the UNC Center of Heart and Vascular Care and Executive Director of the UNC McAllister Heart Institute. We also have Doug Weeks on our panel today. Doug serves as the Executive Vice President of Strategy and Innovation for Baptist Health, Arkansas's largest and most comprehensive healthcare organization, with 12, ho 12 hospitals, over 11,000 employees, and more than 250 points of access across the state of Arkansas. Doug has a long list of awards and accomplishments throughout his 35 years with Baptist Health and he's served in numerous roles from hospital president to senior vice president of hospital operations. Doug has been instrumental in leading Baptist Health's partnership with UAMS, which is why he is a key part of today's discussion. We also will have Ashley Hilbin. Ashley serves as chief strategy officer and senior vice president of strategic marketing at Arkansas Children's. In her role, she works closely with senior leadership and the system's board of directors to guide the implementation of Arkansas children's strategic goals and objectives. She leads planning efforts, advancing business strategy, and oversees marketing and communication for the state's only pediatric health system. She is responsible for new business development and outreach focused on advancing child health initiatives as part of Arkansas children's bold new promise 
unprecedented child health defined and delivered. During her tenure, Arkansas Children's has served more children than ever, achieved the highest ranking in the U.S. News and World Report, and expanded its regional footprint and, and embarked on the largest expansion in its history. And Mitch Bettis will be our moderator today. He is the owner and president of Arkansas Build Business Publishing Group, the award-winning digital marketing and media company founded in 1995, and he is the owner and president of 360 West, a media and marketing company in Fort Worth. He has more, to, more than 30 years of experience in management and publishing. Mitch manages the daily operations of the publishing company that produces more than 30 publications and a digital marketing company with businesses across the United States. He also serves as the publisher of Arkansas Business, the state's business magazine. Thank you all for joining us today. Thank you, Debbie, for that uh, introduction. Um, I want to thank um, uh, the members of the Rotary. I want to thank the R Rotary Club. Uh, it's truly an honor to have the opportunity to speak today uh, about proton therapy uh, in my role as a radiation oncologist at, at UAMS. Um, I had to pinch myself this morning. Am I really speaking at the Rotary Club in the presidential, uh, the Clinton Presidential Library? And it's it's truly an honor. So I have the monumental task of providing the framework or background um, about proton therapy. Um, and you really don't want to hear much from me. We want to, uh, we want to turn it over to the, to the panelists in, in, a, in a few minutes. Um, so as, as, as you know, uh, the Proton Center of Arkansas opened in the uh, fall of uh, 2023. Um, we are located on the, the campus of, of UAMS. Mm -hmm. Uh, and we are the first, uh, first and only, let's just say we're the only proton center uh, here in the state of Arkansas. A little bit of background of, about cr cancer therapy. There are three components. Chemotherapy, you've heard about. You've heard about surgery. Maybe you've heard about radiation. I'm a radiation oncologist. I did a, a four-year residency um, in, in radiation oncology, and I'm going to try to teach you what I know in five minutes. <laughs> uh, without... Uh, it is not just about one doctor. Uh, it, we work as a team. We have a team of nurses, uh, dosimetrists, physicists, radiation therapists who deliver this state-of-the-art treatment. And here's a picture of our, of our proton vault uh, with our team members. When you think about radiation therapy, there are different forms. Uh, there's brachytherapy or external beam radiation. Um, and then what's highlighted in red is what we are going to talk about today, and that's proton therapy. What's important to know is that radiation causes damage to cancer cells, but it also can cause damage to healthy, normal tissue. So the name of the game is, how can I kill the cancer while protecting normal, healthy tissues and reduce the toxicity of a, of a curative treatment? I would do a disservice to the physicists in the room, um, but I'm gonna break this down. If any proton talk has, has this picture, and it's, it's called a, it's, it's, the diagram is called a Bragg peak, and it's comparing x-rays, which is kind of the traditional form of radiation, versus protons. The impor important point is to know that when a pro the proton beam enters a patient, there's less entry dose and no exit dose, and that is, uh, different from x-rays. So imagine if you were invisible and I had a flashlight um, or you, you know, we could see through, that flashlight, what goes in is going to come out. That's how x-rays work. With protons, that's not the case and that has to do with the, the fundamental physics of a heavy particle. We treat multiple disease sites from head to toe, head and neck cancers, brain tumors, lung cancers, prostate cancers. We treat from all ages, from we've, we've treated babies uh, at our proton center um, all the way to adults, whether that's curative or whether that's palliative. And a picture is worth a thousand words. Uh, and so here uh, you see uh, on the, the left hand of the screen what the kind of the older form of radiation therapy uh, looks like. In the middle of the, the diagram is a target. It's a red circle. And you can see that red, uh, that red high-dose area um, 
and it kind of traverses that whole path that I was talking about. What goes in must come out. But all the way on the right of the screen is a, a dose distribution, a picture of what proton therapy looks like. And you are looking at a brain, and what you can see is that that purplish, bluish color is much less than some of the other forms on the left. And so that's where the benefit is. Uh, we are reducing the dose to what is important, prime real estate in the brain. Again, head and neck, head and neck cancers. Uh, in the middle, you can see um, the, the, the dose distribution of a head and neck cancer. So let's say you have a, a cancer of the tonsil. Imagine, of course, a long course of radiation every day, Monday through Friday for seven weeks. It's gonna, it's gonna kill the cancer, but it's also gonna ablate or, or get rid of your salivary glands, and so you have permanent dry mouth for the rest of your life, and you may even have a feeding tube for the rest of your life. But there is a, a, a major benefit in reducing the toxicity uh, with proton therapy, and I think in a, in a couple of weeks at our, one of the national cancer meetings, uh, we're gonna see data, so we have evidence that protons is better than x-rays in, in head and neck cancers. Once again, this is a picture um, uh, of a of a, of, a, of a chest, um, and so here they're treating breast cancer, um, and in the middle of that picture is the heart. On the, on the right side, you, you, can, you can see that the, the dose to the heart, the middle structure, is much less, even non-existent, compared to the, the picture on the left. And as I mentioned, we do treat children, we treat babies. So we do a, a type of radiation that is called craniospinal. So we're treating the brain, we're treating the, the spinal cord from, from head to toe, well not to toe, but to the, the, to the lower back. Um, and again, on the left, you see how the radiation goes right through uh, the patient, and on the right, we can, that, that dose can stop. That trans, tra translates to better, um, better tolerability, tolerability of the treatment. So why, why proton therapy in Arkansas? I was, I was talking to Jay, one of the Jays that was mentioned, um, that, uh, and I, that's something that I learned is that there was talk about proton therapy almost 20 years ago. I didn't know that. Um, and when I first heard about proton therapy in, in Arkansas in like 2019, I think that's when the conversation started, I thought, oh, is that really gonna happen? That's truly a, a dream. But it really took the, a vision of the, of the leaders in this room represented by our, our, our partners and, and people like you are represented through the Rotary Club. Um, and also leadership. Without leadership, we, we would not be here today talking about Proton Center of Arkansas. And so I, got, I had the opportunity, my name is just one little blip in this circle of the core team that was involved in this project, uh, which spanned um, you know, almost three years uh, and I do want to point out that the, um, we, we did, uh, you know, finish this project in a record time in towards the tail end, tail end of a pandemic, and the commissioning of the machine uh, had, has has broken records. But more importantly, it was done safely uh, by by the leadership of our chief physicist Zong Su, uh, who is here in the audience. Um, as mentioned, we are one of 43. Uh, proton facilities in the country. There are more to come. What, what did patients do prior to, to our facility here in Arkansas? Well, they have to go out of state. And we, we immediately know that uh, multiple patients face, face uh, disparities. They have to travel. They have to uproot their lives and move to, to a nearby state. But they, don't, they no longer have to do that as they can get this curative treatment here in Arkansas. And I'll just show you some pictures. Uh, but th this is a very he heavy piece of machiner mach machinery. This is the, called the cyclotron. So it came all the way from Belgium where it was put together and traveled by boat for about two weeks and landed in Texas and it made its way to here in Little Rock. Um, and this is um, some other pictures as the, as the crane uh, unloaded the, um, the, the cyclotron into the building and uh, also the gantry. So it's very heavy piece pieces of, of mach machinery. Another picture, um, and so this is a picture uh, or a, a mock picture of what our machine looks like and our wonderful facility, which you might have driven by on Cedar, if you're driving through Cedar and Pine. So it's uh, in inclusion, Proton, Proton Center of Arkansas, Proton Therapy is here, it's here to stay, um, and I wanna, you know, recognize the, the, the leaders, um, you know, our partners in the, in the, in the joint ventures from 
uh, Proton International, uh, UAMS, Baptist, and, and ACH, uh, as well as we, you know, we could not do this without uh, our the chair of radiation oncology, uh, Dr. Fan Shaw. Um, and uh, here is Dr. Uh, Song Su, our chief physicist, showing off, showing off his toys, very expensive toys. You have a lot of people to thank. And we, we hit um, uh, a milestone, or we will be hitting a milestone um, with nearly 100 patients treated uh, since the fall of 2023. We've made the map. And um, I think one of the purpose is of, of me talking to this group is that you can be an ambassador to this important treatment. Um, you can help patients who, who are denied this curative treatment by their insurance companies. You can be the leaders where, you know, who, who's gonna change the policy, who's gonna work with insurance companies so we can do better for the, for the whole state. Uh, if you'd like to learn more, and uh, I had to kind of go through this very, very quickly, uh, but please uh, don't hesitate, but and we'll, we'll schedule a, schedule a, a tour. Uh, thank you. Are we good? There we go. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Maraboyina, uh, we appreciate that. Uh, you also did an exceptional job. He was a little nervous about presenting to you all and condensing uh, all of that technology or that uh, uh, down to sort of a, some simple premises. The, the premise today is he's delivering the science and we are talking about the partnership. Let's not confuse the fact that we can't answer any specific question. They have more abilities to do that probably than I do, but um, this unique technology that you've heard about uh, being the first of the kind in the state is also um, the result of a unique partnership. And that's in part what we want to sort of explore along the lines of this particular technology. I don't know if this is the right metaphor for this crowd, but it would be, to me, it's something like Simmons Bank, OZK, Centennial, and First Security deciding to partner together on a service rather than forge it alone, right? And I, that's almost hard to conceive of in most any other type of industry. So I think what has happened here in terms of this kind of breadth of partnership is pretty unique and strategically important, and that's in part why this uh, all-star panel uh, is is uh, here today. So as, you, as, as uh, Dr. Sanjay mentioned, the technology here is really, uh, one of its key benefits is to really zero in to minimize damage uh, in a cancer treatment. And I bet if I asked everybody in this room to raise your hand if you or a member of your family has had a cancer journey, I suspect it's many of us, if not the majority of us. So I'm thrilled you all are here to sort of talk about how this partnership developed, what it's going to mean to the state of Arkansas, and, uh, and sort of what are the steps going on from here. So you ready to roll? Sure. All right, let's do it. Uh, so maybe we start with that idea. So why, uh, how did this partnership come together? Uh, how do um, three, for lack of a better word, competing organizations in some respect uh, come together to think about this and how did that sort of happen uh, so I, I guess Dr. I kick Patterson it off. you're on yeah, yeah. so uh, first of all I want to thank the Rotary for the invitation and pulling us all together I want to thank uh, Sanjay for that presentation uh, which was spectacular although you got one thing wrong it's no longer pine and cedar it's UAMS Boulevard oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know the the idea for uh, a proton beam therapy center came together pretty soon after I got to, to Arkansas, and it, it, it really was not about pulling together uh, this coalition, because this coalition already existed. Uh, Arkansas Children's and UIMS have been married for over 40 years, uh, and we work closely together. Uh, you know, there's no competition at all there. It's completely uh, a joint mission to improve healthcare for children in Arkansas. And, and our relationship with, with Baptist uh, was already established when I got here and has been really growing almost exponentially. Uh, we now have two joint ventures in cancer care, one in, in North Little Rock and one here in, uh, at, at Big Baptist. Uh, we have doctors who go back and forth between our facilities all the time. So, you know, f from my perspective, this is, you know, not creating 
uh, this collaborative team is taking advantage of the collaborations that were always already there. And to me, that's what made it so easy. Doug or Ashley, sort of any other notes on how we got here? Well, Cam called. <laughs> I would I would echo what Dr. Patterson said. I think we don't live in a competitive environment to begin with, although we would challenge the banks to do something similar. I'm just kidding. Um, I think for for Arkansas Children's, you know, the reality is children make up 20% uh, of the population. Um, when you look at research in this space, it has lagged. Uh, when you look at healthcare advancements, some of those have lagged. And for us, the infrastructure of healthcare is enormously expensive. We would never be able to do something like you're hearing about without partnership, nor would anyone in the state want us to. And so really what drove the decision was what's the right thing for kids? Right now, um, 17 families since we've opened this space have not had to relocate uh, to get this care. And we, we talk about a lot of science and a lot of numbers, but for us, and Amy Allen is here who is our Vice President of Patient Care Services, Sarah Neal is here who is our Director of Cancer and Blood Disorders. They've worked in that space for 20, 30 years for us, the way this lands on a family in Arkansas is you're packing up your stuff and you're relocating. Someone's likely losing a job. Uh, other family members are impacted by schooling. The financial burden is extensive. And so what we really guided this partnership for us was really those patients, those families, and thinking about what we knew we could do if we could get to a level of agreement about operating, um, about how we would provide that patient care and what we knew the health outcomes would be if we could actually implement this. Yeah, I might, I might point out a couple of for instances that you might not know. Um, and I see Dr. Art Squire, he'll remember this very well, uh, one of your members. So over 40 years ago, UMS and Baptist Health partnered for physical medicine and rehabilitation and has, has had residents ever since uh, in that world. And, and moving forward, um, graduate medical education and accountable care organization. So really the thought process around partnering, even though we compete in a lot of areas, the thought process on, on a technology that's so expensive um, was, was not a hard one, really. It, it just seemed to make sense. Um, we don't share the similar pi patient population with Arkansas Children's, but we're even today thinking about other things that we might consider moving forward. Yeah, interesting. So, okay, so Ashley sort of alluded to this. Now the business guy is curious about sort of the operations. Like, how, financially, how does this come together? Are you three equal partners splitting a check three ways? Is there, how, how does that mechanically happen? Is there one sort of in charge and two minority shareholders sort of in our language? How does this partnership sort of work? I, I, th I think the, the partners kind of went into this based on the percentage of the facility and the operations they wanted to own. So, uh, you know, I would say if you asked a finance person, is this an equal partnership? They would say not quite. But I think if you asked us, is this an equal partnership? We would say yes. And maybe I'm. And I'll, uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't give a, a lot of credit to Dr. Patterson and the UAMS team. It has been an equal partnership, although UAMS has taken on the, a lot more of the burden in terms of seeing this project to completion um, of the operating piece of that. And so you always have that partner that uh, is sort of the safe partner to say, we're going to figure out how to get this done. And we really worked together in the beginning to say what's right for each partner. And there was a ton of flexibility early on for us exploring something that we had never done before um, and how we could actually make that right for all of our organizations. Yeah, I think we've each deferred to who has a lot of strength and a lot of skills in certain areas, and UMS certainly brings a lot of the physician manpower and, and other specialists that, um, you know, that, that Baptist Health didn't have available. Right. Yeah, no, I can see that. Uh, so I want to get to, you've sort of alluded to X number of families being able to stay at home, and there's a, an economic impact that's probably calculated and into this somewhere that we'll get to, but can we, let's start with sort of the health impact, uh, first of all. Um, what do we sort of see now as, the, as, as more families have access to this particular technology, not technology, how do we think that'll affect the health outcomes of um, individuals and families sort of walking through this journey? Is there some way to sort of categorize that? Well, I'll, I'll speak from a pediatric perspective first. We are living in a remarkable time in terms of the advancement of healthcare 
uh, in terms of things of gene therapy. We literally can alter DNA today in a way that we, you know, is just sort of uh, brilliant and mind blowing all at the same time. 50 years ago, there were cancers in pediatric population that would have been fatal, that 20 years ago weren't fatal, but had enormous implications for the quality of life of that person 10, 20, 50 years into the future. When you're treating a child, you're treating a, a human whose future life has uh, enormous potential. And so proton therapy from a, from a physical standpoint, you're talking about growth plates, you're talking about development that hasn't ha yet happened, puberty, all of those things. The level of precision of radiation allows for a quality of life that is just remarkable. I think the, the second piece of that is really thinking about just what I talked about, the ability to keep a family intact in what is an enormously challenging time um, for a patient and for a family going through cancer care. So you know, we talk a lot across our health system, children are enormously resilient, and yet they do not take care of themselves. So we don't treat children, we treat families. And that's a really important piece of this, to actually keep a family as close to home as possible and really uh, bring a quality of life forward that, again, 50 years wasn't possible, and 20 years, if it was possible, it would look really different than it, than it can with this. Yeah. I th <clears throat> think that when Ashley said that kids don't take care of themselves, she was talking about my kids. <laughs> Um, I, you know, I, I would like to, to piggyback on what Ashley said, and you know, as I look around this room, uh, I suspect that almost everybody in this room, before we had our proton center in Arkansas, if you needed proton beam therapy, you could have figured out how to go somewhere else to get that done. But that's not true for the majority of our Kansans. Um, and so having proton therapy in state provides access for all Arkansans um, and puts, does not put people in that difficult situation of saying, hey, I know that there's a better therapy for this cancer that I have, but I just can't get it. I can't afford it. I can't make it happen. That's no longer true. Um, and one thing that I'm really proud of is, as we think about uh, the benefits of proton therapy is that it, it's also getting paid for and every single commercial provider um, in state is providing reimbursement for these services. It's remarkable that that has happened as quickly as it has. And I, I think it speaks to the commitment of Blue Cross and others uh, that this is something that we need to provide for people in the state of Arkansas. And the last thing that I would say is that if you're going to an oncologist who's not referring their patients to Proton Beam Therapy Center, um, then there's something wrong with that oncologist. Now, Doug, you mentioned the interesting stat you were doing some research on that might sort of add some color to this sort of health impact. Yeah, um, I don't know if Sanjay put, pointed this out, but I've read where up to 20% of cancer victims potentially qualify for proton therapy, and that's a pretty significant number that was having to travel out of state or might not be receiving that therapy previously. Yeah, so, so again, so the, the, the health impact is pronounced. Um, I'm sure there's some way, is there some way to sort of calculate even that economic impact of what a center like this does for Arkansas, of others, tra not only keeping our folks here, but also probably others traveling to here. Is there some equation for just the impact of that sort of uh, health? Well, we certainly want to see it in the black, and um, we're not quite there yet, but, um, you know, we ran the pro farmers, and it is a significant economic impact based on the labor that we need in that center to bring in physicists and radiation technologists, et cetera. And uh, yeah, it'll be a very healthy component of the economy here in central Arkansas. You know, think about the hotel industry and, and dining and things of that nature. It's certainly significant. Yeah, you know, I, I think Doug is mentioning, I, I think one of the, the big challenges here is that it requires highly specialized individuals to, to pull this off and, you know, Sanjay's one example, but uh, you, know, you talked about physicists who need doctorate degrees, radiation technologists, and, and that's been, I, I, I would say, our biggest limitation is, is the time it takes to recruit people when there's no base of those individuals in the state. So we kind of have to, to 
to start from scratch. And you know, we're making progress. Uh, you know, in the first full month that we um, opened the center in October, we did 140 treatments. In April, we did over 400 treatments. We're now up to operating 12 hours a day. Uh, but we would have the capacity on the machine to do even more treatments if we have more individuals. And we're, we're doing things proactively to, to begin to rectify that situation. I'm really happy about our partnership with Arkansas State University. Uh, we'll now be uh, taking their radiation technology students on board in, the proton, in uh, our proton center so that they'll get trained on it so that hopefully we'll hire them. I think the thing that I would want to add is we're certainly describing this as a costly um, venture, and it is, but uh, certainly for us, and I'm sure you guys would echo this, for us in terms of recruiting the brightest scientists and the brightest physicians to Arkansas, or educating the brightest minds and the brightest physicians in Arkansas, having these types of highly specialized programs not only allow us to serve families, but it really allows us to recruit those folks because we're offering this type of program. These are folks who have spent years, some decades, in medical school and in advanced training. And so for us, it's part of a complete cancer and blood disorders program for pediatrics. 15 years ago, we had families that were leaving the state because of bone marrow transplant. We did not have an accredited bone marrow transplant program. We did not have proton therapy. Those, those gaps have, have closed for us, and it's not a coincidence that we see our ability to recruit national scientists and see folks in Arkansas that are going to med school that are then doing their residency and fellowship want to stay in Arkansas because we're providing these services. And I think that over time, while you probably can't show it in 12 months, over time, when you think about the generational impact for healthcare, we will all benefit from that. Um, there will be time for a couple of questions. If uh, you have a question, you might get it ready, uh, and we'll get a microphone to you all. While they're getting that set up, you started mentioning some number of uh, individuals served or the number of treatments. Um, do we have a sense of kind of how many, I think uh, Dr. Sanjay mentioned 100, the 100th patient is coming up. So how, how does this sort of correlate? What do we think we'll serve in a year's time? Can you quantify? How many families are benefiting from this even in these early days? Is there some kind of numerical context that somebody can provide? Yeah, so, you know, we have capacity to add additional shifts on, uh, on the instrument. Um, so, you know, I, I would imagine that in a year's time, if our growth stays the same, we probably get to about 1,000 treatments per month, something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, we're over 400 now. Yeah. Um, and if we did that, I, I think the bean counters would be happy. <laughs> and before Jay asks a question, we have a group that watches online as well. So you're beaming all over the globe at this point. Uh, we do have a question that came in online, so let me get hers first, because it follows up with something, uh, Dr. Patterson, I believe you just alluded to, and it feels a little bit in conflict. Uh, how can we, as members of this audience, what can we do to help expand insurance coverage options for proton therapies? The implication here is they perhaps weren't at one point and are now, or are they fully covered? Is there anything, any concern with insurance or the major insurance providers that are it's still developing? I think my biggest concern is on the kids' side, Medicaid, and making sure that, that Medicaid doesn't reduce its reimbursement for these services. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, Jay? Uh, we built several, financed several of these a decade, 15 years ago, and it's a really exciting technology. But it takes a huge number of, of uh, uh, pa patients and what is the break even you are probably losing seven ten uh, ten million or more uh, this year we couldn't afford that <laughs> but, but who, who, who is responsible for the what's the financial makeup is it the state helping you uh, no this is a, you know this is a joint venture it's a joint venture between the three parties here and Proton International, and we share the upside and the downside. And so what's the break even then? So I, I, I don't know off the top of my head, but I, I would think if we get to six or 700 treatments a month, we're probably gonna be a break even. Very good, Dan, right back here. Amy's uh, mm -hmm. doing a yeoman's effort. Uh, Go ahead and raise your hand too, and we'll get you coordinated. There's some time for uh, Thank you for coming. Uh, this is very exciting in the healthcare industry. I have two questions. Um, first is where is CARTI in this picture? And then second, was there ever one of those oh darn moments when you're moving this piece of equipment into the building and you're firing it up for the first time? 
All right, where do well, we want to start? I'll take the car tie piece, and, they, and we're, we're hopeful that they'll refer to this excellent technology, and we think they will. I mean, it's technology they presently do not have, and so we anticipate that they'll see that that be, it will be a huge benefit to their patients, and so we expect those referrals to come. And I do remember the party that was thrown to watch that thing fall into that hole. They had to leave a hole in the, in the ceiling to drop it in, and it was, uh, I think, uh, there were a few folks worried about the ropes that were being lowered. Yeah, you know, so it took, uh, Sanjay said it took two weeks for uh, the ship to go from Belgium to Houston, but I think it took five weeks for a very slow tractor trailer uh, to bring it from Houston to, to Little Rock. So did I have anxiety about that? You bet I did. I'm not sure why they didn't come up the Arkansas River, to be honest with you. <laughs> Ashley, would you add something? All of that was fascinating. And I think the, you know, when you, when you see how heavy this equipment is and you hear how expensive it is, you, don't want, you want everybody to just be very slow around it. Um, I think watching the construction of the building was fun, but, but there is nothing like seeing a patient come out of that room and knowing that that family has been served. And uh, a small group of us, I think it was a Friday afternoon, were able to be over at um, the Proton Center when the first pediatric patient, Gracie, was um, received her last treatment. And we sat with that family and no one wanted to leave, right? It uh, was just a really joyful, quiet afternoon where sort of the enormity of what we were able to accomplish together, you really saw it make a difference in a, in a person's life. Yeah, so that's, that, that, that's my favorite moment. And luckily we got some pictures of that and that'll, that'll be kind of how I remember this, this partnership coming together. On a practical level, are there Baptist and children's oncologists in and out of the center? I mean, is it just, um, We'd see different uh, white coats with different logos, just sort of part of this partnership, or how does that sort of labor arrangements? Are they all just employees of the center? What, what, how does the, the people yeah, the, part the of this? The Baptist oncologist would refer to a radiation oncologist and would, would probably never really set foot unless they're visiting a patient. So mm -hmm. yeah, not really coming and going. Our pediatric oncologists have two badges. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're already wearing, you know, flying the Children's Hospital flag and the UAMS flag. Yeah, the, the, the road between UAMS and Children's with cancer and blood disorders stays busy. So we have folks that um, even before proton therapy with radiation oncology are constantly serving in both of those locations to meet the needs of, of kids. Yeah, interesting. Any last question here before we... Yes, sir. My bow tie brethren. So now you have chemotherapy, you've got radiation, you've got immunotherapy, and now you have proton therapy. How do you decide which one to use? Yeah, great question. <laughs> yeah, so you, you, you ask the, the expert. Do we need to get Dr. Sanjay back up here? Yeah, uh, um, and, and, and they sort it out. You know, it depends on, on the type of the disease, it depends on you know, the age of the patient, it depends on a whole lot of variables. And, you know, and I, I, but I think the important thing that you, you mentioned is the different modalities that are now available. And Ashley was, was talking about this too. Um, my hope is that the next modality that's available is the modality that prevents cancer. Mm -hmm. the, the edge of medicine is always expensive, but it's also why we're all in this room right now. At some, at some point, the edge of medicine has served you and your family to get here. I think over time, the, the economies of healthcare will allow for proton to not be as expensive as it is today, but we're a long way away from that. And so how we think about utilizing this in the most effective way, value-based way is, is incumbent upon all of us. Thank you, uh, Doug, Cam, Ashley, Sanjay. We appreciate you all being here. This is pretty exciting technology to have in our backyard and we are excited to see that develop. We'll turn that back over to Natalie, who you all stay seated just for a second uh, and Natalie will dismiss us here. So. Thank you to each one of you and to Dr. Sanjay for a great presentation. It's fascinating what is happening in healthcare, like you said, Ashley. So um, thank you all for your time today. And before you head out, we do have a little something for each of you. I'll just have you guys pass these down. Um, we get a mural down in the River Market.
Thank you. Um, and this is just a, uh, a something for your desk that reflects that mural because we want to make sure to remind people of the power of fun and the health that it brings them. Um, and I know you guys know that as healthcare providers, so thank you. All right, guys. Um, so for next week, another not to be missed meeting. It really is the perfect program for the Rotary Club. We are going to hear all about the Civic Arkansas program that the Winthrop uh, Rockefeller Institute um, just launched. It is all about um, engaging our community in civic engagement and really teaching them how to um, to be better citizens. And I think there's no better program for Rotarians to hear about. So look forward to that, and we will see you next week. Thank you.